And now, because um, uh, our, uh, Dr. Wheelock has known our final speaker for so many years, I have decided to ask Dr. Wheelock to introduce our final speaker, Sherry. Um, so it's been, as I mentioned before, my pleasure to meet so many amazing families over the years and in, in, um, in the work that we've done in our clinic. And our next speaker, Sherry, is a remarkable, exceptional young woman that I've known for a long time. Um, Sherry will tell you her story individually. I want to tell you that she's a member of the board of the HDSA Northern California chapter, which is one of the best chapters in the country. She's also one of two advisors for the National Youth Alliance chapter in Northern California. She's one of the remarkable young people who reaches out to people, uh, young people ages 9 to 30, who come from families affected by HD, whether they have symptoms already, or they're understanding their risk, or they're helping take care of their parents or brothers or sisters. She's there to reach out and help people. And with that, I'd like to introduce Sherry. Hi, my name is Sherry, and um, I'm going to talk about what it's like to be at risk for Huntington's disease. Uh, this is a picture of me and my mom's dog, Marco, at Christie Field in San Francisco. We have our annual HD walk there every October, and Marco looks forward to it every year. <laughs> um, he's now the baby of our family. So as you know, I am 27 years old. I was born and raised in Sacramento. I graduated from college in the Bay Area in 2005 and, and am currently living and working in San Francisco for an alternative investment consulting company. I have two older brothers and an older sister, and that's my mom, Judy, back here, the blue. <clears throat> um, actually, I'm just going to go back a slide. So um, the foggy weather kind of in San Francisco is how I feel about my future with HD, and I dream that my future will be bright and sunny someday without having to worry about it. Um, <clears throat> so everyone's experience with being at risk is different. And um, so far, there have been three phases in my life. And the first one is um, having family members who have already passed away from Huntington's disease. So the um, man on the left is my great grandpa, Joe. He died from Huntington's when he was 60 years old. And the woman on the right is my grandma, June. And she died from Huntington's when she was 55. And the man in the middle is my Uncle Joe. He died from Huntington's when he was um, 53. And he was a, um, my grandma had already passed away when I was born, but um, my Uncle Joe was a, a very important part of my upbringing. And um, he didn't have any children, so all of his um, nieces and nephews were kind of like his kids. And he'd go to our graduations, and we'd go to his house. And he liked to see all of us compete together and race in his pool. So here are two pictures of me and my dad. and. Uh, the picture on the left um, is me when I was probably about six and so my dad was 36. And the picture on the right is when I was um, 19 and my dad was uh, probably about 50. And as you can see, um, the picture on the left, my dad is squatting. And the picture on the right, he is bedridden. So a lot changed from those years. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so this is phase two, growing up with HD. And um, often, I'm laying, I'm actually sitting with him in his hospital bed on the right, because we kind of, my sister and I like to try to sit near him and hold his hand, so. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, my dad was sick for 11 years, and he was diagnosed when I was nine years old. My parents called a family meeting to uh, get us all together and tell us. And I think that was the last family meeting we ever had. <laughs> it was just, um, we didn't need to get together to talk about that. but. Um, they told us that my dad was diagnosed and that we were at risk, and we all knew kind of what Huntington's was like because my uncle Joe had already been sick with Huntington's ever since I can remember. He had a lot of chorea, and actually my dad had more Parkinson's symptoms. He was very stiff and rigid, so, um, and more psychological kind of issues. Um, my dad passed away when I was 20 years old, and um, often when he was sick, I would see his sweet self come out of the shadows of HD. But he had a lot of psychological changes throughout his battle with Huntington's. He suffered from severe depression, <clears throat> suicidal thoughts, hallucinations, uh, lack of patience, violent outbursts. He had obsessive compulsive issues and um, anxiety. 
Um, so my dad's uh, behavior was really difficult to be around during the progression of his disease. And he would do things like uh, ask us to go help with the dishes. And you know, most adolescent kids are like, oh yeah, one minute, like I'm doing my homework. And then, uh, but if we didn't come right then, he would lose it and uh, like grab our arms, spank us, and he just had no patience. So he was kind of like a ticking time bomb. We kind of never knew what would set him off. So it was, you kind of try to um, just make him happy. Do it. If he's asked to do the dishes, go do the dishes. Um, but it was hard to keep telling myself at such a young age that it was not my dad, that it was the Huntingtons, because my dad was actually a really sweet person underneath it all. Um, <clears throat> my dad was always changing medicines, and whenever he would... Um, my mom was always trying to kind of call Dr. Wheelock and be like, oh, what should we put him on? And then they would try it, and sometimes it wouldn't interact well with the other drugs he was on, and sometimes there would be all these negative side effects, and then they'd have to go back to the drawing board, or if it did work, then his um, symptoms would change, and then they'd have to go back to the drawing board again. So it was just a constant battle, um, trying to find something that would make him feel okay. Uh, when I was in senior in high school, um, my dad got a blood infection and was in the hospital for about a month between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And my, never, my dad never walked again after that visit. Um, his behavior improved now that he was bedridden, though, because I think he didn't have to think about walking and doing all the simple things that, or things that we think are so simple. It, it was hard for him. And when he could um, walk, he was very tippy, would break furniture, would put holes in the wall. Um, he fell down the stairs, hit his head. So. It was always kind of stressful for him, I think, and then we were also worried that he would get really injured, but he never really did. Um, but even just a meal was very stressful for him. Um, having enough coordination to chew and swallow without choking was very difficult, and he had a hard time communicating what he wanted or needed, so we asked a lot of yes or no questions. And my dad passed away in 2003 um, at home in his hospital bed with all of us around him. And um, so my coping mechanisms during that period in my life were to stay busy. I, uh, I was in high school and college, so I had lots of friends, and I swam and played water polo. <clears throat> so fortunately, um, my friends would invite me to their house and make me part of their family as well. So um, I'd also attend the, attend the HDSA national conventions, and those were very beneficial for me because I met other um, kids my age that were in the National Youth Alliance, the NYA, and they had parents that were sick as well. So um, not only did we relate on the level like, my mom or dad with HD does the exact same thing that your dad does, and just knowing that I wasn't alone made me feel so much better. But then also we could discuss the issues with our own life being at risk for inheriting that same disease. So I st we still, I mean, once you meet somebody that can relate to you on that level, you become instant friends and you're friends forever. So I love my HD friends. And, and then also um, through the National, uh, the North California chapter, the HGSA, I've met so many amazing families in the area and we always get excited to see each other at events. And so yes, growing up with HD was very difficult but um, and a very life-changing experience, but I survived and I'm standing here today, so that's good. Um, this is a picture of me skiing just a couple weeks ago for my 27th birthday. And um, the third aspect of being at risk is just dealing with your own life. And I think so far that's been the hardest. So as an at-risk person, when you turn 18, you have the choice of getting tested. Ever since the gene was found in 1993, as Dr. Wheelock was saying, and um, I've decided at this point in my life, I'm not going to get tested. Um, is there a chance I might change my mind? Yes. Like if I decide to have kids or I don't know, it, you just don't know how life's going to change. But for now, I think if I tested positive, I would symptom search even more than I do now. So let's say for my symptom searching, um, if I trip or fall or mess up at work, I automatically think, oh, I might have HD or if I'm having like, if I'm moody or something, I'm like, oh, maybe this is like the first signs and you're just con constantly always like overanalyzing. So if I go about like six to 12 hours without thinking about HD in one day, I'm like, oh, that felt really good, you know? It just kind of overtakes. So you just really have to be disciplined with your thoughts and, um, and just try to stay positive. Um, and then also um, as an at-risker, since I have a, there's a chance I could be negative, although it feels very small, even though it's 50%, um, I kind of hold on to that little hope, like, oh, maybe I'm just 
mental and like thinking things up in my head. So I can't speak for everybody that's at risk, but I think most people that are at risk think there's about a 99.999% chance you're gonna get HD. You kind of just weigh your options like that. You're just like, oh, I'm probably gonna get it. Um, but really it's 50-50. Um, I'm just so terrified to get sick. It scares me more than any natural disaster, cancer, being hit by a bus, I live in San Francisco, being beat up by a bum, anything. It scares me more than anything. And I used to be a very optimistic person, and I still think I am a little bit, but I just can't convince myself that everything's gonna be okay. And I feel like I'm just angry that um, my future might get cheated. I might get cheated for my future. And I, I love outdoor activities. As you can see, I'm skiing. And uh, I love traveling, reading, talking. <laughs> walking, um, eating, <laughs> very good at eating. And um, I just don't want to give up those things I love most in life, my relationships and my independence. And especially since I've seen how my dad, um, his progression on the disease, I kind of know what to expect, which is almost worse than just getting it and not knowing. But everything is affected by being at risk. Uh, medical insurance, long-term care insurance, life insurance, my job. Um, and the reason why I didn't give you my last name is because of this discrimination. Um, and HD folks are discriminated against and it makes life that much more difficult because um, we want to stay silent, which makes all your feelings kind of build up even more and makes you feel worse. But I want everybody to come out of hiding so we could stand together and ask CIRM, the government, and researchers for help. We need help. And I often feel really desperate. Um, just for some sort of treatment or cure. Excuse me. But the only thing I've, I felt optimistic about is stem cell research. And the work Dr. Nolte is doing at UC Davis is amazing. I'm very grateful for her ded dedication and friendship. In addition, my family wouldn't have made it through the HD journey if it weren't for um, Dr. Relock and um, Terry Temkin, the nurse practitioner. I am just so grateful to have such amazing doctors and researchers, and they pour their heart and soul into their work and make a difference to those affected by HD. I'm just extremely grateful, and whenever I'm having a rough day, I think about um, stem cell research, and it just gives me hope, and sometimes that little hope gets me through a negative thought or a bad day, and I'm, it, I'm just very hopeful. So um, this is the last picture. It's of the National Youth Alliance in 2009. Um, we have a convention, the National Convention, every year. And this was in Phoenix last year. And the group keeps growing, so the picture keeps getting farther back, so you can't really see people's faces. But um, everyone in the National Youth Alliance is under 30 years old. And 10% of all HD cases are juvenile Huntington's disease, which means people die usually I think 20 and younger. So just recently, um, Princess Carly is what we call her. You can see her on YouTube. Um, she joined our HD Angels in Heaven at the age of 13, and she was an inspiration to us all. And I share all my stem cell research hope with my HD friends and tell them to stay positive and keep fighting. So thank you, CRIM, for supporting the HD research to fight HD. You give hope to thousands of HD families and hope to the National Youth Alliance for a bright and sunny future. Thank you. Now you all know why we work so hard. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you for your courage and for sharing your story with us. Your work your words, your story, they inspire us and highlight the urgency of moving quickly and safely to clinical trials.